Hello and welcome to another PWN Design Studio tutorial. This will be part two on how to use real world digital elevation maps inside of Gaia. And uh, in this video, it's going to be a uh, part two. Part one, we talked about how you can use MicroDEM to get the information you need. In this one, we're going to be using Global Mapper. And I'm just going to be using the exact same tile that I used from the first video. So if you wanted to get caught up on how we grabbed that, go ahead and watch that video. I split them into two so they're not it's not just one really long video, there's two smaller videos. Alright, so let's go ahead and open up Global Mapper. This is the second time of me trying to record this video. The first time I made a mistake in trying to export some world color data and forgot to uncheck it when I was doing the, the height map and it took forever and I didn't want to wait. So, we'll uh, start from scratch again. So we're going to open data files in the Global Mapper program. And we're going to select the uh, the height tile that we had there that we got from the first video. All right, so measuring things out in Global Mapper is probably a little bit easier and more intuitive than it is in uh, MicroDEM. For instance, getting your Z depth is a lot easier because it gives it to you right here, and it's actually more accurate. This is probably closer to what we had in, as our max value, and this is probably closer to what we had as our minimum value. Additionally, getting the measuring tool out and measuring distances is a lot easier. It, all the distances come out at the bottom here, so keep an eye down here while you're measuring. The measure tool is right here. Let's go ahead and click on that. And we'll do the same thing that we did in MicroDEM. We'll just measure from left to right. And you can see here, both programs are saying that this is about 88.2 kilometers. So they were pretty close. Uh, when you're done measuring, you right click and hit stop measuring. You could also save that measurement if you needed to. You could also do a volume measure where you can click multiple times and get like a different area that you want to measure out. And then when you're done, you can just stop measuring. I don't really recommend going about it that way unless you're doing a very specific area, um, but you could do that if you wanted. Now that'll also make a selection for you. So let's go ahead and remove that by clicking on the digitizer tool, going back and we'll measure from top down. And you can see here, it's showing about 110 kilometers again. So MicroDEM and Global Mapper, they're both pretty accurate in uh, their measuring of distances. Let's go ahead and stop measuring there. So we have the data that we need. We're going to go ahead and make the selection of the area we want. And if you're not going to be doing a selection of an area, and you're just going to be using this whole file, um, that's OK. You can do that. But we're going to make a selection here. And I'm going to do the same thing. It's going to be a 200 kilometer perimeter. So about 50 by 50 by 50 by 50. To do a selection, go ahead and click on the digitizer tool here. This will this will select the um, this, this square and rectangle area feature. We'll create what's called features inside of Global Mapper. And features are where we're going to um, have our selection and do a whole bunch of cool stuff. So if you left click and drag, you can do a non-square extent selection and it'll start from your point of reference and going out. If you wanted to do a selection that's from center, you hold down T. Uh, you gotta reselect the tool. Hold down T and that will select from where you started your selection and then scale out from the middle. That's useful if you have a feature that you want to have a perimeter around. I like that. And if you hold down shift, you'll get square extents. And that's what I recommend using is square extents. So you can get a good even squared value. So I'm going to do 200 kilometers. And if you look down here in the corner or in the bottom, right in this area, you'll see my perimeter. I'm just going to scale that out till it's 200 or close to. There we go. Now you have to give it a name. In this case, I'm just going to call it 200 kilometer. And in the feature layer, you also have to give it a name. And I'm going to go ahead and give that a 200 kilometer name as well as I punch my mic. And it also gives you some additional information on your selection here. So it's close enough to being rounded. Uh, it's about 10 off, 11 off here, give or take. Uh, but it's OK. Uh, it's not going to make that much of a difference. So let's go ahead and hit OK here. And that will give us our black outline here, which is our selection. Now what we're going to want to do is just test out a few features and see if we want anything else from Global Mapper. In order to do that, we want to limit those features to this selection. So select your digitizer tool right here. 
go back to your image, left click and drag over that selection, and it will select the vertices, is what they are called here in Global Mapper, as well as the polygonal volume, which is what it's called in Global Map. So um, if you wanted to move this selection, you could use the Move tool right here, and you can click and drag it somewhere else. When you find a new location for it and you think that you want to move it again, you do have to select the tool again, and then you can move it once more. So if I wanted this top corner, I could use that. All right, so let's say I want to use that top corner, um, and I want to fill this area in with the world imagery data that we can get from Global Mapper. Well, before we do that, we have to make sure, once again, that we have our selection selected like that. And then we can click on this globe icon, and that'll connect us to the database that we need for all the information we want. So it'll most likely default to world imagery for you, uh, but there are a bunch of other things that you can look at if you wanted. I'm going to go ahead and use <coughs> world imagery, and I'm going to download within the currently selected polygons and hit connect. And now we have a color map of that area. That's pretty important, especially if you want real world color data from that location. You can use these inside of the synth tool or synth node inside of Gaia and get a color gradient. Or we can export this out as a JPEG and use it as a color image to overlay on top of our landscape. So we can do a couple things. If you want a more procedural workflow, we could at least get the right color values that we need for that geo geological location through the synth node, um, and then we can just work with it from there. <clears throat> so we have options. All right. So um, additionally, there are more things that you can download. You can do topo maps if you wanted. So if we wanted to do topo maps, we can download um, US topo maps here. We can download within the current selected polygons. And now we have the topo map of that location. So that's pretty cool. But I don't care about that so much right now. Um, and also, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there that you can try out. I just recommend playing with it. But just keep in mind when it comes to export time, a lot of this information is going to be very large and can take a long time to download. And I'm talking about days worth of waiting or even a month worth of waiting for it to download because you are downloading things at like slower than dial-up speeds. So keep that in mind. Um, it's faster than dial-up, yes, but it's only barely faster than dial-up, and it feels like it's slower just because it's so large. So keep that in mind when you're exporting. Um, for now, let's go ahead and focus on getting our height map set up properly. By default, you probably have it set to this, um, or you know one of these other ramps or shaders or gradients. What you want is the gradient shader. And you also want to turn off hill shading. So it, you might have hill shading on, which will look like this. You want to turn that off. And it's just this button right here. Turn that off, and now you have a height map. That's pretty good. The workspace over here is a layering workspace. So if you don't want to see your world imagery on top, you can just move it below your height map, and it will disappear. If you didn't want to see your selection here, you can just move your selection below your height map, and that will disappear. And you can just layer these up however you want, but just keep that in mind as you're working that this is going to be a layering system. All right, so if we wanted to get a decent color map out, as well as uh, like a raw height map that we can use for something like Unity, this does have a uh, export specifically for Unity. So to export a height map and a color map out of Global Mapper, we use uh, we go to File, we go to Export, and we export raster image format. And from here, we can choose Unity Raw Terrain slash Texture. And then in here, you can set the terrain size and the te terrain texture size. Please note that 4096 is the largest for the texture size, and the terrain size, the largest, is 4097. You can't go 8K here. Um, so just keep that in mind. And if you work in Unity, you know that it has a plus one pixel workflow, so it gives you the plus one here by default whereas the texture will be your square extents, or your power of two. 2048 and 2049 are totally fine uh, in most cases anyways, but you do have at least a couple different options in here if you need slightly larger, lower. So um, I'm just going to keep them at default because anything higher is going to take a long time to download, and I just want to keep this quick, so I'm just going to keep it here. We are going to use the layout specific or the layout specified on the tiling tab, because if you don't select that, it will, for some reason, still export tiles, even if you don't select no tiling. 
Um, so we're just going to keep this selected here, tiling, no tiling, and export bounds. We're going to crop to selected area. And then we're going to hit OK. It'll ask us where we want to save it. And I'm just going to save it as test2. As you can see here, I've already tried it once because of the last video, which failed. Um, I'm just going to save it on the desktop, hit save, and it will overwrite that old file. And it will download, and you can see here how slow it is to download. Um, I don't have that slow of internet. It is just connecting to third-party sources and downloading from those, so it takes a while. All right, so now we have a color map and a height map that we can use in Unity, but that doesn't help us in Gaia. This height map that it creates is a raw file, but it's not going to be usable in Gaia. You'll, you'll get a whole bunch of weird issues um, importing it, and it just won't look right. You can see here it exported out 2048 for the color map as well. So we're actually going to get rid of that file. We just wanted to use the Unity export for the color data uh, because anything else that we choose is just going to take way too long. So I'm actually going to delete the world imagery. If you don't want to delete it, save, but you're going to want to delete it because if you don't, you're going to be waiting for literally days for it to download. <clears throat> okay. So now we're just going to go ahead and we're going to export one more time as a raster image format. And we are going to choose the GeoTIFF. Hopefully it's not too large of a selection, but we'll find out. We're going to do 24-bit, uh, black and white, one bit per pixel. Um, min is black for the palette. And we don't really need to resample, but you can do bicubic interpolation. That'll help with some smoothing. And see if there's anything else that we really need here. Nope, we don't need anything else here. So let's go ahead and go to tiling. Make sure we have no tiling selected. Export bounds, crop to selected area features, which is our 200 kilometer feature there. Click OK. And we're going to save this as test2. Save. And then if the area is too large, it'll let us know. But it looks like it's going to work just fine. Cool. All right, let's open up Gaia. You can see here we still have the one that was open from the first video there. So let's do new so I can walk you through on how to properly set things up. We do need to make sure that our terrain definitions were set back to defaults, which they were. Okay, let's delete those and put in a file node. I'm hitting my mic. Sorry, I'm just punching you guys. I don't mean to. And let's load up that file. One of the things that we might have to do is see how large that file is. It's 1809. That's close enough to 2048. You can get into Photoshop and resize that and set it to a, a canvas size of 2048. But you don't have to. And it actually looks like the TIFF file broke when we set it to one bit per pixel. So if that's the case, we'll just go back and we'll re-export export elevation or export raster image format we'll do choose geotiff and instead of doing black and white we'll do 24-bit rgb full color things like that and everything else will be the same we just want to make sure that we're doing the selection there and we'll save over this one that probably worked out better so let's let's give that a try Yes, there it is. That is a much better selection. So don't do the other one. Uh, do the 24-bit. That should work for you. Now, even though it says 24-bit, we are still going to get stepping in our image, our image, um, if I don't talk like a Uton. And uh, well, in the last video, I showed you how you can fix that, but I'll show you how to fix that in here too. All right, so I know we exported a 200 kilometer perimeter, which means that each side is going to be 50 kilometers. So I'm going to go ahead and set this to 50,000, which is 50 kilometers. And we can actually go back into Global Mapper and grab a more accurate height elevation reading, 3,475. So in the terrain definitions, we'll set the height to 3,400 and what I say, 25, 75. Oops. Yeah. 75. There we go. So that would be the accurate height data for that location and the size of the, uh, the scale, the, the total scale. 
All right, and that's looking pretty good. And again, you can increase the height if you don't like those proportions. I don't recommend it, but you can if you wanted to just exaggerate the proportions a little bit. But I try to keep it as close to what the actual values are. Alrighty, so let's go ahead and change this to 1K. That way it fixes our shadows. And you can see here we have a nice digital elevation map here of a real world location. And the stepping is starting to come in pretty bad. So to resolve this banding and stepping issue, we are going to use what's called a heel node. So there's heel. And just like in the last video, my recommendation is if the default doesn't work, then go to 10 uh, or anywhere in between 5 and 10. And if anything in between 5 and 10 does not work well for you, then try 15, anywhere between 10 and 15, but I have never had to go higher than 15 to get a good look, personally. But if you have to go higher than 15, then so be it. But uh, start out at the default, uh, which is a pretty good well-rounded amount, and then just work your way up to 10, and if nothing in that range works, go to 15. In this case, um, 10 seems to be working just fine. I could probably actually go lower, but 10, 10 is doing just fine. And then, just like the last one, last video, I'm also going to throw in a little bit of er erosion um, and I'm going to reduce the amount down to one and the strength to 25 and we'll call that good. We don't need a whole lot of erosion here because the, t the terrain is already eroded based on the elevation. All we're trying to do is just give a little bit of data for Gaia to work with. And now we can also do a lakes node here because there is a river and a lake in this area. And it does a pretty good job at filling in those lower elevations. But again, it's filling in areas where there isn't necessarily any water. But you can be more selective about that if you want. We also downloaded a color map. So let's go ahead and put in another file node. We're going to select this as RGB. And we are going to select our test to JPEG. There we go. And we are going to mark this as overlay. And there we are. I don't know why it's doing this in the JPEG. Um, but I mean, it's probably something that we can work around. I don't know why it's doing that necessarily right now, but uh, we can, I'll try to figure something else out. Oh, maybe adaptive scaling will work. Yeah, that seems to have fixed it. Okay. Adaptive scaling seems to have fixed it. So anyways, that is how you can get some real world color data in as well. But again, like I said, you don't have to use just that. You can do it procedurally as well, because this is, this is just color data. Um, and it looks pretty good, but it's still low resolution. And you're not going to want to use that for your final product. It does look really cool. You can use it as like a far away map if you wanted. And as you get closer, it gets to better textures with like normal maps and things like that. Um, or as a template, but uh, if you wanted to use this specific color grading for a uh, like a procedural workflow, you can use what's called the synth node. And in the synth node, you can connect that to you connect this file node to the synth node, um, or you can connect this to just the erosion. Sorry, and then you load up that same file and it will gather those um, that color data based on the markers on the image now I'm not entirely sure if JPEGs are a good way to uh, a good thing to use but let's see if we can it looks like it is gathering that color data we just got to increase the slopes here we have to play with it for a minute there we go all right whoops let's reduce the rotate there we go now we're getting what we need. Let's change the steps to like 50. There we go. 50 is a, a good amount. So what it's doing is it's actually sampling that image and getting color samples based on these markers, which are these stops. So the less stops you have, the less uh, markers you have, and the finer the gradient. If you wanted a very sharp and noisy gradient, you just have more stops. You could also increase the base fuzzy amount. Um, you're going to have to increase it until it starts recognizing the color data anyways appropriately. So in this case, it looks like five is a good default value. 
You can rotate it if you need to get like a different variety of colors, but I'm not going to play with that. This isn't a synth node tutorial, but you do have that option now. So let's actually use a texture here. <clears throat> I'll just let that build out for a sec. And this is a pretty close to 2048 height map, but I'll just keep it at 1K for now. All right, we got a texture map, and now we can actually set that up to the synth. And now we are getting um, that color data here that it found from that file. And we can start playing around with the stops and the rotation to see if we can get a different look. So you might have to increase the fuzzy again or decrease it even, maybe increase the stops. The synth node does have a few issues that I've noticed. I think it's one of those nodes that will probably be reworked. but um, you, you have the option to utilize a synth node with a color map to get the, the same kind of color grading um, as the real world imagery. So that was the point I was trying to make. So anyways, that will conclude this specific tutorial. Um, and this was how to grab uh, digital elevation maps, import them into Global Mapper, export a height map, and export a color map and import it into Gaia for reprocessing. If you have any questions um, or any kind of comments or uh, suggestions, please shoot them at me. You can join the Discord. That'll be linked in the description as well. And I hope you guys have a fine day.